Welcome to Hollywood Graveyard. Today I turn the camera over to you, the Hollywood Graveyard community, as we travel the world to visit famous and historical graves in your neck of the woods. In this video we're exploring Canada to find legends like George A. Romero, Gregory Hines, Tim Horton, and many more. My friends, the time is yours. Welcome to part nine of our viewers special. We're working our way closer to home, landing back in North America after two videos abroad. Today we're spending some time with our friendly neighbors to the north in Canada. Welcome friends to Canada, Canada friends loves you. This is a special video for me as I'm part Canadian. I'm also part Italian, making me a proud Cantalian. Canada has given the world numerous stars, from Celine Dion and Ryan Reynolds to the entire cast of SCTV. Welcome to our movie. Eh? So without further ado, let's pour ourselves a glass of milk from a bag, and in the immortal words of Five Iron Frenzy, Let's go to Canada! We'll spend much of our time today in the province of Ontario. We begin in Toronto, and the Toronto Necropolis, where we find a legend of horror filmmaking, George A. Romero. If you're a fan of zombie movies, then you know the name George A. Romero, considered the father of the modern zombie film. In 1968, he made a little independent film titled Night of the Living Dead. While not the first zombie movie made, in fact, the movie never uses the word zombie, Night of the Living Dead established many of the tropes we've come to associate with zombies, being slow-moving, mindless, reanimated corpses hell-bent on consuming the flesh of the living. The film would become one of the most successful independent films ever made, and spawn a number of sequels in a popular series of Living Dead movies. Other films include Creepshow and Monkey Shines, and he also created the TV series Tales from the Dark Side. George A. Romero died from lung cancer at age 77. Like Romero, our next star had multiple videos submitted, a testament to how beloved he is here in Canada. This is York Cemetery in Toronto, where rests Tim Horton. He's remembered as one of Canada's great hockey players, playing much of his 24-year NHL career with the Toronto Maple Leafs. With Horton, the Maple Leafs would win four Stanley Cups. In 1964, Tim would open his first Tim Horton's Donut Shop in Ontario. Tim Horton's would grow to become a multi-billion dollar franchise, one of the most familiar names in coffee and donuts in Canada. But Tim Horton's life and career were cut tragically short in 1974 when he died in a car accident, driving while intoxicated. He was just 44. Tim was posthumously inducted into the Hockey Hall of Fame. Also here at York we find a Russian Grand Duchess by the name of Olga Alexandrovna. She was the daughter of Tsar Alexander III and the sister of the last Tsar of Russia, Nicholas II. As the youngest child, she would become the last Grand Duchess of Russia. Her brother Nicholas, along with his wife and children, which included Anastasia, were massacred in 1918 by Bolshevik revolutionaries. Olga escaped the Russian Revolution in 1920, moving first to Denmark, then settling here in Canada. Throughout her life, Olga would find considerable success as a painter. She lived to be 78. Our next Toronto stop is Mount Pleasant Cemetery. Here rests Frederick Banting. Before 1922, diagnosis of type 1 diabetes was a death sentence. But thanks to modern medicine, and innovators like Frederick Banting, Charles Best, John McLeod, and James Collip, that is no longer the case, and those with type 1 diabetes can live a full life. Frederick Banting was a physician whose research in the 1920s led to the discovery of insulin as a therapeutic treatment for diabetes. His efforts would not only earn him the Nobel Prize in 1923 and knighthood by King George V, but would save millions of lives in the generations to follow. In 1941, the plane Banting was riding and crashed in Newfoundland. He survived the impact, but died the next day from his injuries and exposure. Frederick Banting was 49. Here too we find Charles Best, another Canadian medical scientist and a co-discoverer of insulin, working as Banting's assistant. 
Best was omitted from the 1923 Nobel Prize, an omission the committee later admitted was a mistake, though Banting did share half the prize money with Best. Charles Best would go on to be nominated for the 1950 Nobel Prize for his work with choline and heparin. Best passed away at age 79. Our next stop here at Mount Pleasant takes us to the Columbarium to find the niche of John Rutsey. You Rush fans remember John Rutsey as a founding member and the original drummer for the band Rush. The band formed in the 70s here in Ontario, and John played drums on the band's 1974 debut album. John was instrumental in driving the band's early direction, but he left the band shortly thereafter due to health problems. He was replaced by Neil Peart, who many music historians and fans alike would argue was one of the greatest drummers of all time. John Rutsey died in his sleep from an apparent heart attack at age 55. Moving on now to Park Lawn Cemetery to find another beloved Canadian musician. Here lies Jeff Healy. He was a rock, jazz, and blues guitarist and singer who rose to popularity in the 80s and 90s. His talents were of particular note because he was blind. He led the Jeff Healy Band, who had a hit in the song Angel Eyes. To turn your angel eyes my way. Healy also starred alongside Patrick Swayze as Cody in the movie Roadhouse. In 2007, Healy underwent surgery to remove metastatic tissue from his lungs. A year later, he died of sarcoma, a form of cancer, at the age of 41. He would be posthumously inducted into the Terry Fox Hall of Fame and Canada's Walk of Fame. This is Rose Lawn Cemetery. Here we find the grave of Morley Safer. He was a journalist and CBS correspondent, best remembered for his long tenure on the television news program 60 Minutes. He joined the cast of 60 Minutes in 1970, and would go on to be the longest serving reporter on the program, over some 46 years. During that time, 60 Minutes would be the most watched, most profitable program on television. Safer received numerous awards over his career, including 12 Emmys and three Peabody Awards, and was also known as a gentleman, a scholar, and a man of integrity. He died at age 84, a week after announcing his retirement from 60 Minutes. We leave Toronto now for Erin, Ontario, and Erin Cemetery, where rests Stompin' Tom Connors, the king of Canadian folk country music. Connors wrote hundreds of songs, selling millions of albums, many of which have become important parts of the Canadian cultural landscape. Some of his best-known songs are Sudbury Saturday Night, Bud the Spud, it's Bud the Spud on the right red mud, rolling down the highway smiling, and the hockey song, often played at hockey games, sort of a hockey analog of Take Me Out to the Ball Game. Oh, the good old hockey game is the best game you can name, and the best game you can name. Stomp and Tom Connors died from kidney failure at age 77. In 2004, he ranked number 13 on the list of greatest Canadians. This is Avondale Cemetery in Stratford. Here lies Patty Crean. In the early days of his career, in the 30s and 40s, Patty rose to prominence as a choreographer of fight scenes in movies and on stage, for the likes of John Gielgud and Errol Flynn. He also performed frequently as Errol Flynn's stunt double. His system of stage combat direction and safety protocols would set the standard for fight direction for years to come. Patty Crean also acted in films like War and Peace. He lived to be 92. Let's head to section 23A here at Avondale to find the grave of Richard Manuel. He was a musician, remembered as the vocalist and keyboard player for a band called The Band, popular in the 60s and 70s. The band backed Bob Dylan for a time, and went on to have success with songs like The Wait. No was all he said. Take a load up, In 1986, after playing a show in Florida, Manuel died by suicide. 
hanging himself in the hotel bathroom. He was 42. The band was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1994. We're in Woodbridge now, and Queen of Heaven Catholic Cemetery, where rests Tony Rosato. You fans of SCTV recognize that name. Tony was a comedian who joined the cast of SCTV in 1980. He would then join the cast of Saturday Night Live in the 1981-82 season. Then in 1985 he landed a regular role as Whitey on the TV series Night Heat. Later in his career he would be known for his voice work, perhaps most notably voicing Luigi in The Adventures of Super Mario Bros. 3 and Super Mario World. Rosado died from a heart attack at age 62. This lovely churchyard is found at St. Peter's Anglican Church in Arendale. In these grounds rests legendary jazz pianist Oscar Peterson. He ranks among the very greats of piano players in history, called the Maharaja of the Keyboard. In a career that spanned some 60 years, he would release hundreds of recordings, win eight Grammys, including a Lifetime Achievement Award, and perform thousands of concerts worldwide. He would also accompany greats from Ella Fitzgerald to Nat King Cole. The beloved pianist died from kidney failure at age 82. Let's leave the graveyards a moment and head out to the train tracks. We're in St. Thomas, Ontario, and this behemoth of a monument is to the world's most famous circus elephant, Jumbo. Born in Sudan in 1860, baby Jumbo was captured after his mother was killed. He landed at the London Zoo before being sold to showman P.T. Barnum in 1881, becoming the star of the Barnum and Bailey Circus. In the years that followed, Jumbo would travel across the country, entertaining crowds and becoming one of the best known animal performers in the world. But tragedy struck in 1885. Jumbo was walking along these train tracks, returning to his train car, when he was struck and mortally wounded by a locomotive. He died within minutes. After his death, Jumbo's skeleton went on display before landing at the American Museum of Natural History, and his hide was stuffed and displayed at Tufts University. The hide was destroyed in a fire in 1975. In 1985, this life-sized monument to Jumbo was erected here at St. Thomas, not far from where the preeminent Pachyderm perished a century earlier. Jumbo was one of the inspirations for Disney's Dumbo. Back to the cemeteries, this is St. Volodymyr Ukrainian Cemetery. Let's head to Section 2J to find the grave of Gregory Hines. He ranks among the great tap dancers of all time. Many of his acting roles would feature his dancing skills, like The Cotton Club in 1984. Crazy rhythm, I've gone crazy too. Other memorable film roles include as Josephus in Mel Brooks's History of the World, and Ray in Running Scared. In the 90s he had his own TV sitcom, The Gregory Hines Show, and voiced Big Bill in the animated series Little Bill. Among his many accolades are four Emmy nominations and a Tony Award for Best Actor in Jelly's Last Jam. Gregory Hines died from liver cancer in 2003 at the age of 57. Resting here with Gregory is his wife, Negrita Jade. She was a Canadian bodybuilder and fitness expert. She wrote a number of books on women's fitness, including Super Vixen, Secrets for Building a Lean and Sexy Body. She and Gregory were engaged at the time of his death. Just six years later, Negrita fought her own battle against cancer, passing away at age 51. This is Padre Shalom Cemetery. We visited this site in part four of this series to pay our respects to Corey Haim. We're back again today to find more stars in these grounds, including actor Harvey Atkin. His memorable film roles include as Morty in 1979's Meatballs, and on television he played Sergeant Coleman in Cagney and Lacey from 1981 to 1988. Harvey is also remembered for his voice work, having voiced King Koopa in the Super Mario Bros. Super Show and The Adventures of Super Mario Bros. 3. Harvey Atkin died from cancer at age 74. 
Also here we find Paul Kligman, another actor known particularly for voice work in animated productions. He voiced several characters for Marvel in their various animated series in the 60s, including Red Skull in Captain America and J. Jonah Jameson in Spider-Man. And in the spirit of the Christmas season in which we're releasing this video, Paul also voiced Donner and Comet in the stop-motion animated classic Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. From now on, gang, we won't let Rudolph join in any reindeer games, right? Right, right, right. Kligman died from heart failure at age 62. Continuing our exploration of Padre Shalom, we reach the grave of Al Waxman. Canadian audiences remember him for his starring role in the CBC series King of Kensington, which ran from 1975 to 1980. Other series include Cagney and Lacey and Twice in a Lifetime. On film, he voiced Rudnick in Heavy Metal. Waxman died during heart surgery at age 65. Look up, way up. This is Fairview Cemetery in Grafton, and the grave of Bob Hummy. Canadian children knew him as the Friendly Giant. He created and hosted the children's television program, The Friendly Giant, from 1958 to 1985, in close to 3,000 episodes. Generations of Canadian children grew up with The Friendly Giant, who told stories and sang songs. Bob Hummy died from cancer at age 81. This quiet remote cemetery is Sacred Heart in Corbeil. Here we find Emily Dion. She was one of the five Dion quintuplets, who became world famous in the 1930s for being the first known identical quintuplets to survive infancy. The quintuplets were born premature to poor farmers in rural Ontario and were feared wouldn't survive. To cover medical costs, shortly after birth they were taken from their parents and named Wards of the Red Cross, and subsequently the government, which provided for their care, but also exploited them for profit. They became a significant tourist attraction, and an entire industry was built around them. Their specially built farmhouse nursery became almost like a child zoo, with tourists streaming through daily. The quints were said to have brought in more than 50 million in tourist revenue in Ontario being at one time a bigger draw than Niagara Falls, and even starred in ads and three Hollywood movies together. They were reunited with their parents at age nine. In their adulthood, the quintuplets sued the Ontario government for their exploitation and were awarded $4 million in damages. Emily dedicated herself to becoming a nun, but suffered from seizures. After one seizure in which she rolled onto her belly and was unable to lift herself, she accidentally suffocated into her pillow. Emily was 20, the first of the quintuplets to pass. As of filming, two of the Dion quintuplets are still alive. We find ourselves now at Whitechapel Memorial Gardens in Hamilton. Our next star went by the name of Frankie Venom. Real name Frankie Kerr, Frankie Venom is remembered as a founding member and lead singer of the Canadian punk band Teenage Head which formed in the early 70s, and rose to national fame in the 80s. Frankie performed with the band until his death from throat cancer in 2008, at age 52. The epitaph, Picture My Face, is an allusion to one of their songs. Someday you remember me and picture my face. Our next stop through the graveyards of Canada takes us to Farringdon Burial Ground in Brantford. Here is a name instantly recognizable to hockey fans, Gretzky. Not Wayne, but his father, Walter. He was known and beloved across this country as Canada's hockey dad. He was an avid hockey player in his youth, and while he never made it to the pros himself, he built a rink in his backyard for his children, and raised and coached them in the game. He was a key figure in the success of his son, Wayne Gretzky, considered by many as the greatest hockey player of all time. Two of his other sons, Keith and Brent, went on to have NHL careers as well. Canada's hockey dad lived to be 82. Here too we find a writer by the name of Thomas Costain. He was a journalist who became a best-selling author in his 50s, known for historical novels. Among his best-known works are The Black Rose and The Silver Chalice, both of which have been made into movies. Costain died from a heart attack at age 80.
This is Emily Presbyterian Cemetery in a town uniquely named Omimi. Here we find another notable Canadian writer, Scott Young. He was a journalist and novelist, penning some 45 books in his career. He wrote for publications like the Saturday Evening Post and Sports Illustrated. Scott also hosted the sports program Hockey Night in Canada. Scott Young also has a very famous son, musician Neil Young. Scott lived to be 87. Next up is St. Andrews and St. James Cemetery in Aurelia, Ontario. This is where Franklin Carmichael is laid to rest. He was one of Canada's notable painters, known as a member of the Group of Seven, which were seven Canadian landscape painters from 1920 to 1933. He was famous for his use of watercolors and oils to capture the landscapes of his beloved Ontario. Carmichael died suddenly from a heart attack in his car at the age of 55. Greenwood Cemetery in Owen Sound is our next stop. Beneath the waving Canadian flag we find flying ace Billy Bishop. During the First World War Billy Bishop was credited with 72 victories, making him the top Canadian and British flying ace of the war. In 1917, he single-handedly attacked a German aerodrome on the Eris front, destroying seven airplanes on the ground and shooting an additional four airplanes down. This would earn him the Victoria Cross. During the Second World War, Bishop was an air marshal, instrumental in setting up the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan. Billy Bishop died in his sleep at age 62. This is Leith United Church Cemetery in Leith. Here we find another painter, Tom Thompson. He was a landscape painter in the early 20th century, considered a progenitor of the Group of Seven. Two of his best known paintings, The Jack Pine and The West Wind, have become icons of Canadian culture. Thomas's untimely death by drowning at age 39 was seen as a tragic loss for Canadian art. Our last Ontario stop is at Union Cemetery in Oshawa. This is the tomb of Samuel McLaughlin. He was an automotive pioneer, founding the McLaughlin Motor Company in 1907, the first car manufacturer here in Canada. It would eventually evolve into General Motors Canada. McLaughlin was also involved in philanthropy throughout his life, donating hundreds of millions of dollars to the arts and sciences. His estate in Ontario has also been the filming location for dozens of film and television productions, from Billy Madison to Hollywoodland. Colonel Robert Samuel McLaughlin lived to be a hundred. Leaving Ontario, let's briefly head west to Queen's Park Cemetery in Calgary, Alberta. In these grounds we find the grave of legendary wrestler Owen Hart, part of the Hart dynasty of wrestlers. His career wrestling began here in Calgary before rising to prominence in the World Wrestling Federation. Regarded as one of the best in-ring performers of his era, his accomplishments include being a one-time USWA Unified World Heavyweight Champion, a two-time WWF Intercontinental Champion, a one-time WWF European Champion, and a four-time WWF World Tag Team Champion, as well as the 1994 WWF King of the Ring but tragedy would enter the ring in 1999. Owen was making a descent into the ring from the rafters above as the Blue Blazer during a live over the edge pay-per-view event. Shortly after beginning his descent, his safety cable snapped and Owen fell over 70 feet into the ring. He was taken to the hospital, but died a short time later from his injuries. He was just 34. In a controversial move, audience members in the arena who had witnessed the fall were not told of Hart's fate, and the event continued. Heading back east, we say bonjour to Quebec. There's no Canada like French Canada. This is Cimetière de saint jean de Matha. Here we find Louis Cyr, a pioneer of Canada's strongman legacy. In strongman lore, he's often called the strongest man who ever lived. And while modern giants like Zadrunas Savickas also vie for this title, there's no disputing the incomparable strength of Louis Cyr. 
In the late 1800s, long before organized strongman competitions, Louis Cyr was hoisting wagons, lifting globe dumbbells, platforms of people, and out pulling horses. Some of his memorable feats of strength include lifting over 500 pounds with one finger, pushing a freight car up an incline, lifting over 4,000 pounds on his back, and restraining the pull of four draft horses. Louis Cyr died in 1912 from nephritis at age 49. Modern day strongman implements are named for Cyr, including the Cyr dumbbell, and in 2013 a film was made about his life. The easternmost region of Canada is the island of Newfoundland. We're in the capital of Newfoundland and Labrador, St. John's. Here rests a man known as the father of the Confederation, Joseph Smallwood. In 1949, the Dominion of Newfoundland held a referendum on whether it should remain an independent dominion or join Canada. Joey was the main driving force in this effort, campaigning for the Dominion of Newfoundland to join Canada. After a tight race, Newfoundland became a Canadian province, and Joey Smallwood was elected as the first Premier, which he served until 1972. Smallwood died a week before his 91st birthday. Our next stop is Bannerman Park in St. John's. Here we find a monument to Shanadirit. She was the last known living member of the Beothic people, who were the indigenous people that inhabited Newfoundland. They were a peaceful, non-confrontational people, and when European settlers arrived, rather than confronting them, they were driven inland, away from their native lands, which deprived them of their natural food sources. Their new ecosystem and lifestyle was unable to support them, causing undernourishment and eventually starvation. This combined with the introduction of disease like tuberculosis led to the extinction of the Beothic. Shanadirit is remembered for her efforts to document and share cultural and historical understanding of the Beothic, as her people were on the brink of extinction. Shanadirit died from tuberculosis at age 28. She was buried in a church graveyard here in St. John's that has since been lost to railway construction. So this plaque was placed here in her memory. Our next stop is not a grave, but another monument. This one to a great Canadian athlete and humanitarian by the name of Terry Fox. At the age of 19, he lost his right leg to cancer. Shortly thereafter, Fox began training as a marathoner and devised a run across Canada to raise funds for cancer research. It was dubbed the Marathon of Hope. That run began here in St. John's, mile zero, on April 12, 1980. He averaged around 20 miles a day, all with a prosthetic leg. He became an inspiration and national hero in the process. But Terry was forced to stop in September in Thunder Bay, Ontario, when his cancer returned. That month he'd become the youngest person honored to the Order of Canada. He raised millions of dollars for cancer research before his death at the age of 22. He's laid to rest back in British Columbia. We end our adventure through the Great White North in Nova Scotia. Not a lot of white, i.e. snow, in this tour today, because all this footage was actually shot in the summer. This is Gate of Heaven Cemetery where we find the grave of legendary musician Denny Doherty. He was a singer and songwriter remembered as a founding member of the 60s musical group The Mamas and the Papas, with John Phillips, Michelle Phillips, and Cass Elliot. They had hits in songs like Monday Monday and California Dreamin'. California, California Dreamin', such a winner's day. The group was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1998. After the group disbanded in 1968, Denny embarked on a solo career and also dabbled in acting. He's remembered by children of the 90s as the cheerful harbor master and narrator of the kids' series Theodore Tugboat. Denny died from kidney failure at the age of 66. And that concludes our tour. What are some of your favorite memories of the stars we visited today? Share them in the comments below, and be sure to like, share, and subscribe for more famous grave tours. Thanks for watching. We'll see you on the next one.